TV channel Zvezda is on the air. It is combat approved. And we begin this issue in the very place that, in the United States, is officially called the Hornet's Nest. Here it is, the Hornet's Nest of the Russian Army. We are talking about the submarine force of the Pacific Fleet, but to call a cat a cat, this is one of those rare places on the planet where submarine sailors draw their duty, probably in the harshest conditions. This place is called Vilyuchinsk. Most of the year it is frosty, almost half a year. It's covered with ice, and only three summer months can be considered completely snowless. There are no submarine bases operating in such severe weather conditions, neither in the United States nor in any other country in the world. Only our Gajivo in the Barents Sea can compare to Vilyuchinskoy. It is also cold and harsh there, but the warm Gulf Stream still comes there, and therefore Kamchatka is clearly in the lead in absolute terms of negative temperatures. Among all such bases on Earth, this is a true pole of cold. And from the point of view of geography, this is the closest point of concentration of submarines to the United States, moreover those with nuclear missiles. For our overseas colleagues, it is a real hornet's nest, which will become even more powerful over the years. It may not immediately catch the eye, but now there is a large-scale construction in the coastal zone, and these are not only Submariner's special training centers and classrooms. These are, for example, many kilometers of underground tunnels and water mains with distilled water. So, what today's life of the underwater capital of the Far East is and what it will be like in the future. Combat approved. To see the nuclear submarine fleet in the Pacific Ocean with your own eyes, you need to fly to Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky. There, you get into your car and enjoy the views of the volcanoes and the ocean. Then, the eye catches on the icebreaker, crushing the ice, but you go on. In one hour, you pass the first checkpoint. In another 40 minutes, the second checkpoint. Now, when you directly approach the territory of the submarine forces of the Pacific Fleet, your documents are checked. Here you find yourself in a kind of lock chamber gateway. Here we pay attention to the machine gunner, who has his own loophole. We pass on. So, you get into the hornet's nest. But not in its center, one can say. You get to the outskirts. Here you will have your documents checked for the third time. Finally, when you come close to the pier, when you see the submarine with your eyes, it turns out that there is another control zone here. And here we, the journalists, are only allowed to go through with an escort. Please come up here now, accompanied by a high-ranking naval officer with the appropriate access permit. There is another gateway. By the way, it says so here, lock chamber. Entrance one by one, produce your pass. Despite the fact that the officer accompanying us has an electronic pass, he still is producing his identity card. We as journalists prepare our passports. After the fourth check, everything seems to be over. But no, an armed watchman meets you on the pier. In theory, he can open fire. Alt, who goes there? Captain First Rank Kuznetsov with inspection. Here is an interesting moment. We have reached the border of the post. It was here when the same armed watchman shouted, Halt, who goes there? We were stopped. Captain First Rank with inspection, this is our escort, by the way, he is Assistant Division Commander. The watchman contacts the officer on duty in the conning tower. He, in his turn, with the senior officer on board. Soon, the fifth document check begins. And this is despite the fact that we have all the permits. But that's the order. 
Вооруженные вахтины допустить прибывших лиц. This is about how the submarine forces of the Pacific Fleet are protected. Well, it took us almost three hours to go through all the cordons, and at last, the first goal of our visit, the nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine Tver was achieved. Tver is a ship of Project 949A Antony. The ships of this project are usually called the names of cities. Tver, Omsk, Tomsk are on duty in Kamchatka. The main purpose of these ships can be understood from the name of the division to which they belong, anti-aircraft carrier. And today, the Tver is practicing an attack on an aircraft carrier group. First, the simulated enemy is attacked by missiles, with all 12 of them at once. Then torpedoes are used. It seems to many that this is a journalistic cliché. If a film is about submarines, there must be exercises in it. Maybe. But no matter where the submarine is, whether it's in the base or offshore, there are exercises on it not just every day, but several times a day. Combat approved. This film such things many times, even here in Kamchatka. Today's exercise is the kind of exercise that we have never seen before. First, tough guys with machine guns draw our attention. They are not called just somewhere, but to the main command post, by the way. They are all from the crew of Tver. Then the submariners are preparing to fire an igla. It may be surprising. What is the connection between the submarine and the man pads? But this is how the training on repulsing an air raid takes place. But this is still not the most interesting thing. It will be a discovery for many that a nuclear submarine carries not only missiles and not only torpedoes as its weapon, but also, what is it? In this case, you are presented with the DP-64 grenade launcher, the main purpose of which is to destroy fighting underwater swimmers, that is, to provide underwater anti-sabotage defense. This weapon can be used at a distance of up to 400 meters. There are two grenades here. Exactly so, and both combat and signal grenades are used. That is, with the marking of the location of the saboteur and the concentration of fire on him. Another 20 minutes pass, and scouts are called to the command control center. They have galoshes on their feet. There are flashlights in their hands. They will have to go on a recce to a smoky room. Realizing that this task is deadly in a real situation, the officer clearly follows the instructions. He must make sure that the scouts are ready and that none of them has left behind any tools. And now, attention, there's a question. What do you think happens on board a ship if there is a fight with saboteurs, a battle with an aircraft carrier, a torpedo attack, and a fire at the same time? The answer is an annual inspection, but not of the submarine crew, but of these officers in black uniforms. At first, it seemed to me that you were checking the actions of the staff. Is this true? No. Today our main task was to show the trainees how the flagship officers operate, using correct methods of the assessment of the staff operations. In soccer, the competence of the referee is checked roughly the same way. The players on the field can do whatever they want, breaking the rules. It is important that the referees give their actions the correct assessment. Not only the crews of the submarines are under special control here, but also those who inspect them, and even those who inspect the inspectors. After all, there are nuclear weapons on board these submarines. In the United States, your base is called Hornet's Nest. Why? Well, Americans love big names. In fact, our division is called the Joint Submarine Forces Command of the Pacific Fleet. It was formed in 1938 with the arrival of the first three diesel submarines here. During this time, it has been consistently growing, and the unit was called a battalion, then a brigade, a division, then a submarine squadron, submarine fleet, and now it is named the Submarine Forces Command. We recorded this interview in the summer of 2019. Six months later, another star will be added to the commander's shoulder boards. 
And then the Zvezda TV channel had a unique opportunity to visit the Holy of Holies of the underwater capital, the command post. Journalists were admitted here for the first time. A squadron of NATO warships was detected southeast of the Kamchatka Peninsula, crossing northeast, consisting of the cruiser USS Mobile Bay, the destroyers USS John McCain, and USS Decatur. Unlike what we heard on board the submarine, there was no longer an exercise, but a report on the real situation, which went to the very top, to the National Defense Control Center. Information about the active movement of such a large group of NATO ships was taken very seriously there. To the commander of the submarine forces, start deploying forces to combat areas. A few minutes pass, and a second report is sent to Moscow. The first measures have already been taken. In order to neutralize possible threats from the squadron of NATO warships, the Joint Command redeployed forces forming combat duty tasks. And now, pay attention to how the situation in the control center has changed, how the number of large stars on the shoulder boards of the officers present has grown. This means that the submarine forces are on the high level of alert. A couple of days will pass, and it will become clear. The march of the submarines is only part of the reaction to the Kamchatka campaign of the American fleet. At this moment in Avacha Bay, the corvette Soverchny, the command control center ship Marshal Krylov, are coming together. The cruiser Varyag is getting ready for the sailing. Let us repeat, the submarines have already departed, and the submarine base itself continues its usual life. Here is another interesting and little-known episode for most people, demagnetization. The fact is that the metal hulls of submarines are getting magnetized. It is akin to static electricity, which tends to accumulate. Magnetization is dangerous because it unmasks the submarines. Therefore, each time, preparing for departure, the submarines go through a demagnetization procedure. They anchor in a certain place, where, after a while, they will be wrapped in a cable, the electrical current in which will remove the magnetic voltage. In front of us is a multi-purpose submarine of Project 971, Shuka B. Its main task is to protect the strategic warships. In general, four types of submarines are based in Kamchatka. The Shuka, that is one. The anti-aircraft carrier Antony, which are already familiar to us, that is two. They are also called baguettes for the characteristic shape of the body. Number three are Kalmars, with ballistic missiles on board. And finally, the most modern component of the submarine forces are the new ships of the Bori project. They also carry ballistic missiles. The task of both Bori and Kalmar submarines is to imperceptibly go underwater and carry out combat duty, performing the function of nuclear deterrence. And can it happen when we depart to the Pacific Ocean, there will be potential enemy submarines waiting for us somewhere on the way out? Of course. The opposing side is closely watching our activities. They take measures, we take countermeasures. It's a constant game, if I may say so, a cat-and-mouse game. That's creativity, that's art, the art of the submarine service. How much does the introduction of new ships, such as the Bori-class strategic missile submarine cruisers, add to your trump cards in this game? <laughs> Cruisers like Bori probably add trump cards not to me, but to our entire state, because these are unique ships. The essential characteristic of such a ship, it is a floating space launch complex, only instead of satellites, the payload there is of a different nature. So the next morning, we start with a trip to the floating space launch complex Vladimir Vonomak. It is still dark here when the staff lineup is being prepared. A typical start of the day for the crew of any submarine after which the personnel, and this is more than a hundred people, must rather quickly go down to their workplace. The problem is that there is only one entrance to the ship, and it is narrow. 
we stand in line for a submarine. After standing in line and going down the ladder, we come across two announcements. Wipe your feet. This is understandable. The second, the use of mobile phones is prohibited. But this is strange. What mobile phones? The cellular network is not available on board the submarine. But a modern telephone is also a camera, and photographing without special permit is prohibited here. The main weapon of Monomak are the Bulova ballistic missiles. Right now, we are in the fourth missile compartment, and the missile silos are located here, you see. They are marked with numbers, one, two, three, four. There are 16 such silos in total, and during her history, Monomak has launched four ballistic missiles. Each launch is marked with a star. Here, we can see one star, two stars, with the same date here, November 14, 2015. This means that there was a double launch. Here they are. These shots were taken in November 2015. We do not know when the next training launch will take place and whether it will happen at all. But on the day when Combat Approved was working on board the submarine, Monomak put out to sea. But not into the open sea, but into an ice-covered bay. And this means that today, Monomak will have to break out of this icy trap. At the same time, one must understand that a departure from a pier of such a huge leviathan as a missile-carrying submarine is a very serious operation. Even in open water conditions, the assistance of at least three tugboats is required. Proper deberthing is a kind of technical art. It is necessary to carefully move the ship away from the pier so that she can sail slowly. Well, now when the tugboats have arrived, the ship has moved a little, and we have an opportunity to determine the thickness of the ice. Here, you have to understand that this ice is not solid. It is constantly being crushed in the coastal zone by icebreakers and tugboats. And the second moment, since today is not a very frosty day, before today there were quite warm days. The organizers of this operation decided not to use the icebreaker. The ice, they say, is quite soft today, and the tugboats will sure cope with this. Three tugs will participate in this operation. Two of them are now pushing up the submarine's sides, and one more will go with the escort. Here on board this third tugboat, there is our cameraman, who will monitor this whole operation from the outside. As soon as the submarine departs from the pier for a couple of meters, the tugboats begin to clear the ice and push the ship with their boards. Here it is necessary to explain that the tugboats at the moment only help us to maneuver, turn left or right. In general, the submarine moves independently with the help of her reserve propulsion unit, RDK. To put it simple, with the help of electric motors. RDK is a reserve propulsion complex. There are four of these on the submarine. We filmed them at the Sevmash plant, where the Bori ships are being built. They provide movement now. The process is led by Dmitry Longunov, the commander of Vladimir Monoma. From the top of the bridge work, he controls the operation like an orchestral conductor. He selects the course, gives instructions to subordinates, and also controls two tugboats. It comes out that the commander has three steering wheels in his hands. Figuratively speaking, three steering wheels. The complexity of this pilotage lies in the fact that it is necessary to keep the ship exactly at the designated course in ice conditions. How do you rate the ice for today? The ice is good today. It is punctured, so motion is possible without significant problems. If the ice was thick, would you put an icebreaker forward? Sure. The icebreaker's provision would have been necessary to leave the base. Meanwhile, in front of the eyes of the seals, the submarine goes out into the open waters. It seemed from above that we were crawling like turtles. But if we go down, it seems that we are as good as dolphins. Here, it would be worth asking the commander a question. What is the ship's destination? But that's exactly what we were instructed not to ask. Well, now our caravan has entered the ice flow. And here it is necessary to tell that Monomak has the experience of passing under a really large ice flow. When was that? It was in 2016. 
the submarine made her way here by the northern sea route. Did you move under the ice all the time? Yes. The way under the ice was dangerous, so to speak. The maneuvers are all limited under the ice, but we have managed. It seems to me that you don't use enough epithets when you say dangerous. Because the passage under the thick pack ice on a submarine is very risky. It should be noted that not all crews are given the right to participate in such operations. At the exit from Avacha Bay, we hear the command to half-mast the colors. We are passing a memorial place. This is the place where the Anglo-French squadron in 1854 was defeated by the residents of our city, Petropavlost Kamchatsky. For many, this will be a discovery that they tried to take these lands away from Russia. The British and French even landed troops, but our ancestors defended Kamchatka. To the colors. Half mast the colors. Hoist the colors. Stand easy. Navigator. Driving officer, how is her head? 356.5 points. Hold 356. Holding 356. Inertia, good. To the point. As soon as the ship left the ice flows, it seemed that it was already possible to relax. But then the commander announced a muster drill. There is a breach in the hull. The first step is to urgently batten down the compartments and then put on waterproof suits. The main thing is to do everything quickly. We are now in one of the missile rooms. Here is this huge wall, one and two. These are actually the silos in which the Bulova missiles are located. And now one of the elements of the shipboard damage control is being trained here. Which one specifically? Specifically the outside water entry to compartment five. What are the guys doing at this moment? The guys install an extendable support to fix the leak. The main purpose of such classes is to achieve automatism. Seafarers must be able to fix any leak as quickly as possible, even in the smoke, even in the dark. Warrant Officer Yushikov, turn off the hold lights. Now the lights will be turned off. And we will take out our flashlights so that the viewers can still see what is happening now. What are they doing at the moment? At the moment, they are opening the emergency dehumidification valve to drain the hold manually. Right now, it's more or less easy with our flashlight. Let's try to turn it off. In this situation, how do they navigate? Guided by touch. Let's be honest. As long as there is no real leak, the accident does not look terrible. To get a feel for what a real flood is, a whole training center has been built on the shore. What is the advantage of this educational and training complex? Here you can arrange a real flood on a ship, when water will beat from the walls, from the floor and from the ceiling, and moreover, exactly the same flood at this time can be organized in the second room. Here comes the rescue party. The submarine has a standard number of five people, and now their task will be to stop the water in another room. At this time, we take only 10 steps to the side. And here we already have a fire. One of the compartments is on fire. What happened there? There was a fire in the electrical panel and the skin of the ship. That's just now. Wow, the pyro cartridge went off, right? Our operator comes in. Let's explain, in such a situation, we should use... PBA, Portable Breathing Apparatus. It is a device designed to protect the respiratory system. Every submariner should have such a PBA without fail. Yes, it is opened until it clicks and you put it on. Inhale, exhale. The smoke is filling up. In the meantime, an emergency team comes in here. A fire in a submarine is worse than any leak. In a confined space, the smoke spreads so quickly that even submariners do not even have time to put on breathing apparatus. And here we are, in less than 10 seconds, everything around us was clouded with smoke. Firefighters get a fire extinguisher, a hose. They start the foam, a few seconds, and the fire is extinguished. 
From myself, I can add that this device, PBA, turned out to be much more convenient than it looked during filming. Some kind of strange kind of plastic, but it is very, very comfortable. There were no breathing problems, no smoke penetrated. That's it, guys. We've done the job. Let's get out. We shake hands with the winners of the fire. Thank you. The fire has been extinguished in the compartment. It's done. However, this fire did not seem dangerous. It was extinguished too quickly. And then the submariners proposed to increase the degree of testing. It is interesting that exactly the same fire here on the territory of the training center can be organized in a room that resembles a submarine as much as possible. Here we see a conventional fragment of a solid hull. The flashlights at the entrance are exactly the same as those used by our submariners. And unlike that simulator here, of course, the flame can be made much brighter. I am now asking to add brightness, adding, wow, how strong the fire is. You can even add a little more. You probably can't see, but there is already a specialist inside. Come here, please. Let's film the instructor. Here he is now, just ready to start fighting the fire. Come even closer to us so that you can see that there is a man in this hell. He is alive. He is wearing a special suit. Here it is, no longer a PBA, but a much more serious product called ID6. Let's kick up the fire again and start fire extinguishing. The instructor fills the open flame with a special composition and then everything is covered with a layer of foam. A characteristic feature of this simulator is a very powerful ventilation. Just imagine, a room where literally three minutes ago the flames were as tall as me. Until now, these walls are hot. Now here you can breathe quite calmly without any PBA, without IP6. At the moment of the fire, it seemed to us that, despite the special protective suit, the instructor would still get burns. But on the contrary, he was soaked all over as if standing in the rain. While we were extinguishing the fire in one zone of the training center, in another, the submariners were taking turns in leakage control tests. In the third zone, they mastered the methods of rescue using the ILR, a special inflatable life raft, but really extreme loads are experienced by those who were closed in the blind space of the torpedo compartment. It is a real hell for those who suffer from claustrophobia, but this is how submariners will save their lives when there is no other choice. It was a revelation for me that it turns out that every submariner shall pass such a procedure once a year. That's right, they pass once a year. Do all the crews come to you here? All crews and everyone personally, from the commander to the last sailor, shall undergo this test. That is, a person with 25 years experience has passed the procedure for 25 times. Yes, sir. It becomes really scary when they let water into the compartment. If something is wrong with the suit, it's guaranteed death in the dark, cramped, and stuffy conditions. However, in our case, as it should be, everything goes according to plan, and the sailors' submariners safely get out of the pipe to freedom. If you remember the history of the underwater fleet, have there been cases of such ship abandonment? There have been cases of ship abandonment even in Rabaki. It was 15 years ago. The personnel left the submarine right in the bay using a torpedo launching tube. Did everyone succeed? Yes, sir. Everyone is alive, healthy, still living and happy. And the children serve as submariners and are also undergoing the same training with us. The training center is just one of the gears of the large and complex organism of the Pacific Fleet's submarine force base. There is a military town, a headquarters, an officer's club, a complex security system, and the city of Vilyuchinsk adjacent to the base with its ice palace and a huge water park. All this was built especially for submariners and their families. But all these hockey fields and water slides are nothing compared to what is now being created next to the piers of nuclear-powered guided missile cruisers. There is a compressor station and chemical laboratories, and workshops for the repair of diving equipment and rescue suits, ventilation chambers, refrigeration units. You will not see this in every plant. Take the CNS, the Charging Network Station. It really deserves a special notion. This is not just a building, 
it is a smart charger, comparing a submarine to a telephone. And here is what this CNS looks like inside, the first premises of the station. Here, it is necessary to explain what you will see inside is not intended for the maintenance of the infrastructure, but it is exclusively for the submarines. The fact is that voltage surges must be excluded on the submarine, and the current must precisely match the specified parameters. Moreover, different types of currents are used on submarines. For example, in this hall, the incoming alternating current turns into direct current, which is used, for example, to charge rechargeable batteries. Moreover, not everyone knows that in military equipment, not only on a submarine, but also, for example, at the S-300, S-400 stations, high-frequency current is used. We have 50 hertz in sockets. Here it is 400. What is it for? It is used to reduce the size of transformers, motors, and other electrical equipment. And now, attention, here comes a question. If all this, everything that you saw here, is installed, scaled down on a submarine, then why was all the same built on the shore? It's true, she really can provide everything she needs. But when a submarine comes to the base, gets to the pier, it is extremely important that the infrastructure provides her with all the means, so that her materiel that works at sea could rest, could save her motor life. The life cycle of a submarine is about 30 years. If she is self-sufficient, she will live just this period. But by providing resources from the base, we can make the life term of the submarines longer. The base in Vilyuchinsk is the first facility of such significance in our fleet, where the state is making serious investments in the infrastructure. You see only a small fraction of what is being built here. A large number of facilities are not even here, but near this place. Here, many buildings will be changed, more berthage will be built, even the landscape of the base itself will be changed. This is a tremendous work. It will only name one number to illustrate it. More than a million tons of soil will be removed from here. More than a million tons? Yes. More than a million tons? My goodness. This number alone makes it clear how big the changes that await this coastal area will be. And now, look at the many kilometers of tunnels that have been dug here underground. Immediately, I remember the film The Secret Fairway, the fight against saboteurs, real fortifications. Although, in reality, everything is somewhat different. Here is a stainless steel pipe, high purity water supply. Water, in fact, is distilled. After that, potable water and water for the fire extinguishing systems. What's most surprising, there's more than one such tunnel here. Here is the next one. Let's dive in. In this gallery, high pressure steam and sewerage system will go. Then the power supply system. Right now, here in this place, they are just laying the cables. But now, everything here is being built according to the latest technology. 82 years ago, there was a wild land in these parts. The submarine forces of the Pacific Fleet started with just three submarines and a small vessel called Saratov, on which the crews lived. Indeed, almost in the wild, a submarine base was created on the island of Laktajny. There was nothing here but woods and wild animals. Now the base has grown stronger and has become the main eastern pillar of the nuclear shield. A special role in this shield is played by two boring nuclear-powered submarine cruisers, Alexander Nevsky and Vladimir Monomak, that recently arrived to the Pacific Fleet. So we come back again to the floating space launch complex. The next day begins with a torpedo attack. Training, of course. The cruiser gets into position, reaches the correct depth, and raises the periscope. Periscope number one rises, number two rises. All stand back. Periscopes number one and two rise. Yes, this is not a mistake. Modern submarines have not just one, but several periscopes. There's no one around, so we can go on. Now, in order to launch missiles, it is not necessary to show up on the surface. 
Comrade Commander, there are normal launch conditions for all dimensions. This is the drill. Missile attack. Diving officer. Yes, sir. Dive. Pre-launch preparation takes a few seconds, and the cruiser can fire not just one, but several missiles at once. While the alarm sounds in the boat's compartments, an automatic pre-launch check takes place. Senior Assistant Commander, control of normal launch conditions. Normal launch conditions confirmed. C-41, complete control of NLC. NLC, that is normal launch conditions. These are the correct speed, depth, healing, trim, and pressure in the compartments. When everything is normalized, the most important command sounds. Stand by for action. Missile attack. A mandatory maneuver after an attack is to dive deeper into the side. Depth 20, two on the bow, we dive. At this point, it is especially important to understand that the hull has not leaked and that all internal systems are in normal operation. The pressure in the hydraulic system is normal, and of course, that there is no enemy nearby. The acoustic horizon is clear. The battle at the Command Control Center, CCC, is certainly good, but there is clearly a lack of a real enemy. This problem was also solved in Kamchatka, on the territory of the base, a center has been opened where submariners can fight against each other. Let it be on a computer, but in a mode as close to reality as possible, the way it would be during a real underwater duel. Initial tactical situation. Counteraction of enemy submarines of the Virginia type is expected on the deployment route. We are now under the premises of the Universal Specialized Tactical Training Complex duel. Here, with the help of automated workstations, combat posts on nuclear submarines of the generations 2 and 3 are displayed. Now they have a torpedo attack. Yes, now there is a torpedo attack. They are performing a desk combat exercise, an attack, a counterattack of an enemy submarine. Torpedo launching tubes 1, 2, 5, 6, fire. Fire confirmed. Diving officer, hard aport. Steady on course 80. Course 80 confirmed. 250, the boat is diving. Depth level forward, 200. Increase the speed by 10 knots. Working forward, 200. This is the third time that combat approved has come to Vilyuchinsk. And again, we encounter something new. The base is growing at an accelerated pace. But here, I must also say that not only the base is being built, but also the ships for it. These are shots from the secret workshops of Sevmash, the hulls of Bori A-class submarines are being assembled. They belong to the 4-plus generation. As the designers say, there is nothing more perfect in this class in any other fleet in the world. The names of those nuclear-powered ships that will be on duty in the Pacific Ocean are already known. These are the Generalissimo Suvorov and Emperor Alexander III, the legendary commander and one of the most important Russian monarchs in history. The first once wrote The Science of Victory, and the second said, Russia has only two allies, the Army and the Navy. Well, let's add the submarine fleet to this list. And there, the Pacific Fleet Submarine Forces, a unique formation, which despite all the hardships of nature, grows and develops. <laughs>